Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. to the viewers. I am Dr. Priyanka Singh, Assistant Professor, Department of Political Science, DAV PG College. And today, I will be discussing on the topic, Marxism in International Relations. This is my fourth lecture. In the first lecture, I discussed on the emergence of international relations as an academic discipline. In the second lecture, I discussed on the topic of realism, neorealism. In the third lecture, I discussed on the topic liberalism and its various strands. And today, I will be discussing on the theory of Marxism in international relations. To begin with, coming to the basic ideology of Marx. Whenever we talk about Marxism, we have to refer to Marx. Now, Marx is a thinker who is studied in almost every subject of social sciences, in economics, in psychology, in sociology, in political science and international relations. So, Marx has basically given his theory from the point of view of domestic politics. Marx was of the view that history progresses through the clashes of matter. Marx basically focuses on matter, materialism as opposed to Hegel. And Marx basically opines that changes that occurs in the economic base of the society leads to changes in the superstructure. So, base and superstructure are the two important components of Marx. Marx has focused on base and superstructure and in base and superstructure his basic focus is on base and that base is governed by economic relations. So, economy is the basic unit of Marx theory and he bases economy and he opines that economy affects almost every other sector of the society, whether it is political science or politics, whether it is civil society, whether it is religious institutions, everything is governed by the economy and economy forms the base of society. So, if we witness any kind of sociological change, political change or any cultural change, these are all the part of superstructure and this superstructure is governed by the base which is economic in nature. So, Marx basically focuses on when he talks about or when he gives importance to economy, he focuses on the mode of production and he says that mode of production has changed in history. The class structure also keeps on changing. So, when we talk about Marx, there are two concepts. One, I already made you clear that economy forms the base of the society as per Marx theory. Next is that he explains that mode change in the mode of production through history. So, there are two concepts, historical materialism and dialectical materialism. So, when Marx talk about historical materialism, so both historical materialism and dialectical materialism. The importance is of material that I already told you 
that Marx focuses on material thing as opposed to Hegel whose basic focus is idea. So, Marx say that their history is the through history it is very much evident that how the change has occurred. If we talk about the history we should start from the scratch and that was the primitive society. So, in the primitive society also when there was no concept of private property. So, when there was no private property there was no issue of any kind of clash. So, Marx say that that primitive society was what? It was primitive communism. I will come to the topic of communism later on. Then this is the first stage when Marx talk about historical materialism. Then coming to the second stage and that is slavery. When we talk about the subject political science, Aristotle is known as the father of political science and the, as per the theory of Aristotle, he gave importance to slavery. Now, the concept of slavery itself says that the society is divided into two classes. What Marx is trying to explain that the society is divided into two classes. So, Marx say that that second stage of historical materialism and that was based upon slavery. Slavery was evident in that society, the second stage of the historical materialism. Then coming to the third stage of historical materialism and that was governed by the concept of feudalism. So, when we talk about feudalism again it is evident that the society was divided into two classes. Then the society again progresses with the industrial revolution and with industrial revolution comes the concept of capitalism where Marx the concept of Marx actually begins with capitalism because Marx criticizes that particular society where there is capitalist a class which, which belongs to have group and there is other class that belong to have not groups that is the working class that is the proletariat. So, that society which Marx term as the modern society is characterized by capitalism. But Marx is of opinion that this society must change and when this change will occur that society will be called a socialist society where each individual will have his own share that Marx terms as for each according to his ability to each according to his work. The amount of work any person will do that he will receive uh, the profit in terms of the work that he or she will do. But that is stage the stage of socialism is a phase of transition because Marx ultimately aims for communism that will be a classless and stateless society. And this classless and stateless society will be called society of communism where there will be each individual will have his or her particular role, his or her particular share and that was characterized by Marx as for each according to his ability, to each according to his need. So, this is the concept of historical materialism by which Marx try to explain that history is evident that when there was 
the class division except the primitive society in feudal society in capitalist society there is a class division in uh, uh, the, uh, slave during the time of uh, slavery also there was class division during the time of greek and now we have to move out of that uh, class division out of that inequality because society has been equal since the time of greek we have to move out of that inequality we have to move towards equality and how we will achieve that equality through socialism and finally through communism so marx say that when we want to change the society we have to change the base because this base is characterized in terms of economy so as the mode of production has changed in history the class is uh, structure also keeps on changing that marx says and he says that history is nothing but the result of perpetual class struggle so marx as per marx there has always been two classes one is the exploited when we talk about greek times there was a concept of slavery when you talk about modern times there is capitalist and the worker class so uh, as per marx he says that the society is divided into two classes one is exploited and other is the exploiter so the class which is getting exploited is poor and the other class which is exploiting is the dominant class or the exploiter is that class is a dominant class that is a exploiter so this is the basic ideology of marx that he views society in terms of class division when we talk about marx and international relations marx has basically focused on the domestic politics that i already that i have already mentioned so when we talk about international relations marx has not given any direct theory to explain the phenomena of international relations but when he talk about domestic politics there are many concept that is given by marx that can be applied to international relations also for example marx talk about proletarian internationalism what does that mean proletarian internationalism when he talks about proletarian internationalism internationalism he talks in the sense that when marx was trying to motivate the working class to change their present status where that he explained through historical materialism that he explained to dialectical materialism he is basically motivating the working class to change their present status because working class is of the view that they are born to do so but when they are getting exploited actually the time is coming when they are feeling alienated that marx has felt to take them out of that feeling of alienation marx basically want that change should come and that change will come through revolution to motivate the workers to be the part of that revolution he has given one concept and that is proletarian internationalism and this proletarian internationalism basically means that in the words of marx workers of the world unite you have nothing to lose except your chains what does that mean this means that workers of asia africa latin america all are same because they all are facing the same problem that is they all are getting exploited whether they belong to developed country or developing country the condition of the worker is same so marx says that 
workers of the world unite you have nothing to lose except your chains so he basically means that worker should get out of that chain the chain of exploitation so they should not think in terms of boundaries in terms of region they should think in terms of their class and they belong to which class they belong to the working class and all the person of working class are sharing the same problem so we can take his concept of proletarian internationalism in international politics although marx is not given any analysis of international politics his attention has been on the domestic sphere so it can be inferred that when marx say that the society is capitalist we can say that the world is also capitalist so international system is nothing but a capitalist world where some are exploiting others where develop are exploiting developing so when uh, marx talk about domestic sphere he says this there is a exploiter and there is a exploited in the same one is a dominant class which exploiting so in the same way we can say that in international politics also there are some dominant countries that are ex exploiting those who are not dominant those who are weak so the dominant or powerful states for their own sake for their own convenience for their own profit for their own welfare has created some institutions such as un imf world bank so when the theory of liberalism says that the un imf world bank these are the institution for the welfare of all welfare of all the countries when we talk when we see that thing from the perspective of marx these institutions are the representative of dominant class and that dominant class are basically the developed countries so we should also take into consideration the origin of marxist school of international politics so i have already told you that marx has not given any direct analysis of international politics whatever he has uh, said in terms of domestic sphere we can infer that what we can we can say that okay if marx would have analyzed the international politics he would have done in this matter so when we talk about the theory of marxism it is a lenin who has developed the theory of international politics his very famous work imperialism the highest stage of capitalism is the first work explaining politics among nations and lenin explained the first world war not in terms of one group wants to uh, have power or struggle for power okay there can be struggle for power but that power will be used for dominance so lenin explained the first world war as war for colonies and hence it is not war for power it is a capitalist war so from lenin also emerges instrumentalist school which is popularly known as dependency school 
there are some prominent concept of dependency school, what dependency school actually think of. First is unequal exchange. What is unequal exchange? There are some countries who are developed, some are underdeveloped. So, if one country is supplying raw materials, other country is manufacturing that and supplying final goods. The cost of raw material is much lesser than the co cost of final product. So, that actually symbolizes what? It symbolizes unequal exchange. One is getting less, one is getting more. Then uneven development. What is uneven development? Rich are getting richer, poor are getting poorer. The gulf between rich and poor is getting widened. So, this is uneven development. The pace of development is different for develop and for developing. Then it is the development of under development. What is the development of under development? The dominant countries, the uh, developed countries, they are basically saying that we want the development of underdeveloped countries, developing countries. But in the name of that development, actually they are doing their own development and they are exploiting the weaker countries. So, the condition of weaker countries is same as the condition of laborers, what Marx basically says the condition of working class. Then the dependency school basically talks about core and periphery states. Some are core states and some are peripheries. I will discuss this concept of core and periphery in the next slide. So, basically dependency is school yeah, dependency theory is developed by the scholars of Latin American and African scholars. So, these scholars of Latin America and Africa, they basically felt the pain of these underdeveloped countries. So, they saw that whole phenomena from the point of view of third world countries. So, dependency theory is basically the third world perspective. We can, we, there is a need to see the world from third world countries, from the lens of third world countries. Because till now, if you talk about realism, if you talk about liberalism, we have seen and analyzed the world from the lens of developed countries, from the lens of powerful countries. But this school of thought says that there is a need to see the world from the point of view of developing countries. So, it basically represent the voice from the periphery and why this voice is getting raised? This voice is getting raised to challenge the hegemony of western countries because the hegemony of western countries is not good for developing and underdeveloped countries because there is unequal exchange, unequal exchange rela relationship between developed and developing countries. So, basically developing countries need to understand this thing that they are getting exploited. Dependency theory analyzed the impact of the policies of 
developed countries or western countries and especially MNCs, multinational corporations. And the impact of multinational corporations on the economy and political development in developing countries, those who were once the colonies. So, dependency theorists dis distinguish various states according to different economic functions that they perform and they have characterized those functions through various names. So, first highly developed and advanced superpowers like USA fall under center center category because they are the center of power. Next category is periphery center category. So, countries like Canada, Netherlands, Japan they fall under periphery center category. Why periphery center category? Because these countries have significant economic development and industrialization. Not like USA, but they have significant economic development. The third category is the center periphery category, CP. Now, who are these countries? These are the countries that belong to the category of developing countries, but they are growing very fast, their economy is growing very fast like Brazil, India, South Africa and China itself put itself in this category. And the last category is the periphery periphery category which consists of countries that are economically backward like African countries and have they have lot of social issues like uh, Cambodia, Zambia. So, these are the four categories. Now, you can say that China belongs to the center center category, but China do not claim to belong to that particular category. Now, some key points of dependency theory. First, there is no universal model for growth. Dependency theory claims that there is no universal model for growth. The way developed countries has grown and the way developing countries are growing both are very different. So, there is no universal model that what develop will tell us that is the only model of development. Then they want the inclusion of social indicators that was missing till now. They say that there are different market distribution scenario in developing countries. The international there is international division of labor, there is class distinction, there is exploitative global capitalism and the gap between the developed and developing is widening. So, dependency school basically suggests that the closer the country is integrated with international economy, the poorer it will be. Why? Because this international economic integration will only exploit these developing countries. And for that reason the scholars of dependency school of thought opine that the reason for poverty in African and Latin American countries is linked with the MNCs. And that is the reason that these scholars suggest national autonomous development. These 
developing countries, underdeveloped countries need to be autonomous. They do not have to be dependent on developed countries for their development. Because developed countries is only concerned about their own development, not the development of developing and underdeveloped countries. Like the concept of self-help in realism. So, developing and underdeveloped, they have to help themselves for development. They should not be dependent on these developed countries. The prominent scholars are Andrew Gunder uh, Frank, Samir Amin, Theotonio Dos Santos, Rolf Prashbish, and Emmanuel Wallstein. Next is the world system theory. Now, world system theory is the analysis of the working of capitalism at global level. This theory is influenced by the ideas of Lenin. And this theory is basically the criticism for globalization. They criticize globalization from the point of view of Marxist. That how this globalization is leading to inequality in the society. How this globalization is promoting exploitation. So, world system theory is also the critique of the theory of modernization. Because the theory of modernization is actually the tool of exploitation. Because modernization want more industrialization and industrialization will lead to more and more gap between rich and poor. The main proponent of world system theory is Emmanuel Wallstein, who has also contributed in the dependency theory. So, what are the salient features of the theory of uh, world system theory? This theory is both descriptive as well as prescriptive. Now, what does that mean descriptive and prescriptive? It describes the actual state of affairs, it describes that and it, pres it prescribes what needs to be done like the doctor prescribes medicines if they diagnose some problem. In the same way, world system theory provides us prescription that how the problem needs to be solved, how the problem will be solved. So, world system theory basically describes the structure of international politics from in the form of world system and it prescribes that there is a need to move towards socialism because the world has seen enough of capitalism, enough of exploitation. The same thing that Marx prescribes is when he, when he talks about domestic sphere through his theory of historical materialism. When he says that after capitalism which stage will come? The stage will be socialism although that stage is a phase of transition. So, Wallstein says that capitalism has become a world system and it is expanding and expanding and it is just it has spread throughout the globe. So, the expansion of capitalism is actually not good for developing and underdeveloped and this is creating more and more problem and this has categorized states into different groups. So, the scholars of world system theory basically categorizes the countries into three groups core, periphery and semi periphery. Who are core? Core are basically the 
developed countries who are economically very sound, politically very stable. So, these are the developed countries. Peripheries are the underdeveloped. They are basically dependent on core. What is a gen generalization that they are dependent on core? So, they are basically supplying cheap labor and raw materials to the core countries and core countries are uh, transforming that is manufacturing with the help of that raw materials and then they are producing the high profit consumption goods and they are sending it in peripheries at high prices. Between these two group of categories that is core and periphery, there is semi periphery. So, what is the role of semi periphery? They are in between these two countries, the core and periphery. So, they are also like they are absorbing the shock between core and periphery and they are also supplying labors to the core countries, they are also importing raw materials from the peripheries, they are also providing market for the core countries. So, they are basically in between the core and the periphery, this is the Wallstein world system theory model. So, coming to the core countries, who are these core countries? Basically, core countries are those countries who are the dominant capitalist countries, who exploit the peripheral countries for labor and raw materials. So, they the uh, peripheries supply cheap labor and raw materials to these core countries. So, basically the industries of these core countries, these developed countries are ultimately dependent on these peripheries, but what they are claiming that peripheries are dependent on them for their development. So, core countries are basically dominant capitalist countries and there is a high level of industrialization and for those industrialization they need this cheap labor and raw material. Core countries because they are the dominant countries, they own most of the world's capital, capital and technology and as they are dominant they have great control over the world trade. They are also the cultural centers. So, the best of brains from all over the world, they are attracted towards these core countries. So, in a nutshell we can say that they have the concentration of power, political power, economic power, ideological power, technological power, all sorts of power. They own all sorts of power. Now, who are the peripheries? Peripheral countries are basically most of African and low income countries in South America. And as per the core countries, they are dependent on core countries for capital. Why? Because these peripheral countries, they are actually and in most of the times, agrarian societies, there is low literacy rates, low industrialization, uh, no infrastructure, lack of you know internet access. So, they do not have these basic facilities and they are still under neo-colonialism, not in the form of direct, they are not the direct colonies, but they are indirect colonies. 
which we characterize in terms of neocolonialism. So, it is a kind of drain of wealth and the ruling class is the instrument of capitalist countries. Those ruling class, those leaders who claim to be the leader of their own countries, they are not actually the leader of their own country. Which country? These African and low income countries. They are actually the instrument of these core countries because they are helping them to exploit more and more and they are exploiting whom? They are exploiting the citizens of these peripheries. Now coming to the semi peripheries, what role does these semi peripheries have? So, semi peripheries have the characteristics of both core and periphery countries. They are not as developed as core countries, they are less developed than core countries, but they are more developed than periphery, peripheral nations, peripheral countries like India, Brazil, Indonesia, South Africa. So, in this process of exploitation, they are the countries that have got some benefits because of the globalization. They have because they have some amount of technological advancement, some resources, some skilled manpower as cheap labor, but not as advanced as these core countries. So, basically they act as a buffer between core and peripheral countries what I showed you in this diagram. They are the buffer between core and peripheries and because they are the buffer between core and peripheries they act as shock absorbers. They try to avoid the direct conflict between core and periphery because now peripheries are understanding that they are getting exploited. So, they are in turn benefiting the core countries because they are also supplying cheap labor and that labor is skilled. They are a destination for capital investment by the core countries and the most important they are the place for utilization of outdated technologies. I will give you an example for this. We all are fond of um, Apple products. So, whenever a new version of new series of iPhone get launched in USA, the series that was uh, precedent that were previously there, the price of that product gets down, the previous version, the price of the previous version and the as soon as their price drop down, people buy them, but ultimately they are the rejected products from these core countries, but countries like India, they provide a market for these rejected products, outdated products, outdated technologies. So, ultimately what we are doing? We are contributing in the economy of USA. I am just giving one example of this. So, these semi peripheries are providing legitimacy to the process of globalization that is globalization is good for everyone and it is because of these semi peripheries that workers from peripheries have lost the bargaining power because in cheap prices we are providing them skilled 
labor which the semi peripheries are not able to provide so ultimately we have you know taken their bargaining power so emmanuel wallstein basically questions the wisdom of liberal scholars who time and again say that and claim that we are living in the age of liberalism so emmanuel wallstein opined that liberalism is reaching its end because liberalism is very exploitative and the thing which is exploitative is bound to collapse so he calls us economy as a house of cards with one blow that house of cards will collapse wallstein says that all political conflicts all kind of political conflicts have their roots in capitalism so capitalism is the mother of all the conflicts so what we have to do what the humanity has to do what the human kind have to do is that we have only two option either we should move towards socialism or it will if we do not move to socialism it will lead to barbarism but this school of thought also got criticized it also faced criticism because it is said that this model is mono casual why mono casual because it has given too much emphasis on the economic factors like marx did when he explained the domestic affair so economic factor is not the only factor behind any happening that is going on in the world but marx say that economy is the main factor when he says of base and superstructure the base is what the base is economy and the change in the superstructure is because of that base so if you want to change the superstructure you have to bring change in the base of the society so in the same way this model is criticized because it has laid too much emphasis on the economic factor there are other factors also because when we talk about international politics when we try to explain international politics international politics is too complex in nature and it is not any single factor that can affect international politics the positives have also criticized this theory because because of providing insufficient quantitative data so the orthodox marxist have objected because they have deviated from true marxist model and there is no explanation of class struggle so this theory has been subject to criticism next is the contribution of gramsci gramscian analysis now what gramsci says gramsci says that to understand international politics it is necessary to understand culture and ideological factors it is not only the economy through which we can understand the international politics so okay material structure is important gramsci is not denying the contribution of material structure but he also says that culture and ideology cannot be ignored because when gramsci analyzed the reason for the failure of the theory of marxism when he was in prison because gramsci was the contemporary of mussolini and we when he started question questioning mussolini mussolini put him in jail 
So, in jail, he was nothing to do. So, he analyzed the cause of the failure of Marxism because as Marx claimed that capitalism one day will get vanished and socialism will, will come and then ultimately Marxism will come. So, what was the reason that capitalism did not collapsed, it did not got vanished. So, Gramsci came to the conclusion that Marx ignored the role of culture and ideology and that was one of the basic thing that was lacking in Marxism. So, Gramscian scholars those who follow the theory of Gramsci, they give importance to two elements basic structure as well as superstructure. We cannot ignore the superstructure, we cannot say that superstructure is dependent on the base and everything is decided by base only. Base and superstructure both have equal role to play. So, Gramsci has given the concept of hegemony. Hegemony is when we give legitimacy to dominance that becomes hegemony. So, basically the idea of hegemony give importance to ideology. So, according to the Gramscian analysis of international politics, it is necessary to understand that how the ideology of globalization is serving the interest of the capitalist or the bourgeois class. And they say that globalization is sustaining because of the ideology of globalization which has led to manufactured consent. Consent is there, but it is manufactured. It is not something natural. It is getting manufactured. It is through effort that it is getting manufactured. So, even the oppressed sections are also in the favor of globalization. Why? Because of this manufactured consent. So, Grams, as per Gramscian analysis, even the peripheral countries are also convinced that yes, globalization is good for everyone. The free movement of good services and people are good for everyone because it is the globalization that is offering solution to all the problems. So, if any country is facing economic problem or facing political problem, the only solution is globalization. Open your borders, open your economy liberalization, privatization and globalization and all your problem will get solved. So, there is only one alternative and that is what? That there is no alternative, Tina factor, there is no alternative. And this Tina factor, the concept of Tina factor was popularized by Margaret Thatcher. So, what is Tina factor that there is no alternative, the only alternative is liberalization, privatization and globalization. Robert Cox has also contributed in this theory. So, his book Social Forces, State and World Orders Beyond International Relations Theory that was published in 1981. In this book, he has applied Gramscian analysis to understand the nature of globalization. So, he has, he says that, that these, uh, there is a role of social forces, which are the social forces, norms, values, cultural practices, they all are the do norms. And these norms has ultimately benefited the dominant class. So, there is need to question this status quo, 
question this situation because as per Robert Cox, every theory whether it is a theory of realism, whether it is a theory of liberalism, every theory has worked for capitalist class. There is a very famous quotation of Robert Cox that theory is always for someone and for some purpose. And he says that realist and liberal theory are those theory which has been written from the perspective of the dominant class that is the developed countries. And that is the reason that these theories have benefited the capitalist class. There is one more school of thought and that is the critical school. Critical theory has basically one of the very influential theory and it is influenced by the idea of Gramsci. Robert Cox has also contributed in this theory and other schools of thought is the Frankfurt school. Frankfurt school is basically the group of Marxist influence theories. So, critical school is also one school of thought and prominent scholars are Richard Ashley, Mark Hoffman, Andrew Linklater and their basic goal is to overcome the social structures through which people are getting oppressed. So, these thinkers say that expand the moral boundaries of political community and focus on the freedom of human. Andrew Linklater suggests that we can emancipate this world from this exploitation, when we will be able to make the territorial boundaries irrelevant and strengthen the grassroot democracy. And how we will be able to do that? Through human freedom, when people will be powerful and they will be able to take the responsible actions. So, in conclusion, we can say that Marxism has made several changes, several breakthroughs in the development of the discipline. As compared to realism and liberalism, they have given a different perspective because they have given a materialistic conception of history. Although Marxism is also subject to criticism, but till now there is no viable alternative to Marxist interpretation of capitalism in the form of world system theory and dependency theory. So, at least we can say that there is a theory which has looked to the problems of the world from the perspective of developing underdeveloped and third world countries. So, the importance and contribution of Marxism in the theory of international relations cannot be diminished. It will be as relevant as other theories. Thank you.